We're Topple Galloway. I'm Steve Topple. And I'm George Galloway. Thanks very much for viewing this on Patreon.com. We're going to start off today by talking about something that appeared on Twitter in the name of General Mad Dog Mattis. Steve, you put it out, tell us. Indeed, yes. I, I had to write this down, George, because, because it was so staggering that I didn't want to get any of it wrong. Um, so I quote, James Mattis said last Friday um, in reference to Putin, what Putin was doing, that he aims to diminish the appeal of the Western democratic models and attempts to undermine America's moral authority. Um, this from, as you say, General James Mattis about Putin. Now, in parallel with this, of course, we've had the controversy over the ch child immigrants currently being held in cages in, cages. in America. Um, and it juxtaposes in such a bizarre way to that story. Um, the, 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 the level of delusion in that tweet is staggering. Yeah. Uh, I know they think they're exceptional, and they are. They are exceptionally brutal, mm. exceptionally genocidal. Uh, they have exceptionally wasted people all over the world, including in their own country. But they don't seem to know that. The fact that someone with a straight face could state that America has any moral authority in the world. This is a country that only exists because illegal immigrants in significant numbers, firstly from this mm. country of Britain, arrived in their country, massacred its original inhabitants and stole their land. Yes. So there's a good start for moral authority. Indeed, absolutely. And then, I mean, we watched Jamestown, I don't know if you saw any of that, mm. which told the story of Britain's first colony there in Virginia. Uh, and it marks the arrival first of these real knuckle-dragging uh, British colonists, who then promptly brought black African slaves, literally in chains, to come and work for them, mm. to work in their fields, which of course then established two centuries of slavery in the United States. How's that for moral authority? And that was followed, of course, by a series of uh, what can only be called apartheid laws of segregation mm. and subjugation uh, of black people. And that's not to mention invading countries all over the world and massacring their, their people uh, in their millions from, from Vietnam, Cambodia, Chile, the Congo, uh, Indonesia. I mean, you almost lose count. America has invaded 50 countries yes. since the end of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And yet this man, General Mattis, imagines that they possess any moral authority. No, absolutely. It's absolutely ridiculous you talk about um, since the Second World War the number of countries that have been invaded. And of course we mustn't forget some of the coups that have been instigated by US yeah. regimes since the Second World War, not least the situation in Guatemala in the 1950s where the US instigated a coup, fooling the people of the country into believing they were being invaded, all on behalf of the United Fruit Company, who were up in arms because their lands had been taken back by the incumbent leader. And this has gone on for years. So this kind of notion of moral authority of the US just doesn't exist at all. And we all know that. Probably so do uh, the vast majority of the people who will ever see this discussion. I suppose a bigger question is, does General Mattis know it? Mm. Does the American uh, ruling elite, governing class, know, and therefore they're lying when they say these kind of things, or even more troubling actually, uh, do they not know? Uh, do they think they do have a moral authority? In which mm. case, um, how did they come to that conclusion? The reason I ask is mm. because you see, the very things they're accusing Putin of are the very things that they are doing themselves. Um, th they are the ones who are undermining the moral authority of their uh, state. Yet they are projecting that onto Putin 
and Russia. Absolutely, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's a really good point, actually. It's a real conundrum, if you like, as to what is actually motivating the, the US as a state um, to act in this way and have this behaviour. I mean, I think does some of it come from maybe sort of Christian fundamentalism? Because if you look at the situation with Trump moving the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, we all know the root of that was this right-wing Christian fundamentalism that somehow it was part of the resurrection, wasn't it, I believe? The, the rapture, uh, bringing yeah. about the end of times. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and it was important that the centre of that was, was Jerusalem. So I think there's maybe some of that dogmatism in it, if you like, from, a, from a religious viewpoint. I mean, I've discussed this before with other people. There might be an element as well of the fact that the original... Americans, as they were, who came over from England, um, were kind of persecuted over here anyway. That's half the reason they left. They were yeah. religious zealots yeah, uh, um, from the start. Yeah. So is there some sort but of... But I mean, they were village idiots. They were, uh, they, 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 they were straw sticking out their mouths. Village idiots mm. who regarded the black slaves that came to work for them literally as animals. Yes. Uh, they were so religious, these people. <laughs> they were such... So possessed so of Jesus' message yeah. that they actually believed that the black slaves working in front of their eyes were subhumans mm. whom they could rape, whom they could work to death, could chain, could lash. I mean, how religious is that? No, absolutely. How Christian is that? And it's true. It is, it's bizarre, isn't it, really? Yeah. And, and we still see that to this day, although not in, the, not in maybe the extremes. But they're... Then what are you doing the extremes? Well, I'm just wondering, because I, I think it is the bigger question. You see, in Britain, uh, the ruling class never believed the stuff that they were uh, putting out. I mean, when they told the people, we must invade, subjugate, occupy, and loot uh, all these countries around the world so that we can hold their hands and lead them to the promised land or uh, so we could convert them to Christianity or so on. The British ruling elite never believed that. They self-consciously used it. Uh, and that's more honest, yeah. actually, than if you do believe it. But I mm. kind of think that General Mattis and Donald Trump and Barack Obama before him and Bill Clinton before him and Hillary Clinton and so on, I kind of think they may believe it, in which case it's even worse because we're being ruled... Uh, by people who are literally deranged, unhinged, <laughs> exactly. out of their more, minds. It makes them even more dangerous. They're more dangerous. Doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a correction to make from last week's show. I said that Obama was dropping bombs on the Middle East in 2016 at the rate of one per three hours. You did, I repeated it. I did, I got that figure wrong. Um, it was actually, he was dropping bombs at three at, at the rate of every hour. Three bombs every hour in 2016, Obama was now dropping. Now that's the suave... Corona, exactly. tonic cool. more hair, yeah. ultra cool, Liberal achingly faithful to wife and children, mm. was dropping three bombs an hour yeah. throughout his presidency. Mind you, it got him the Nobel Peace Prize. So Down. maybe maybe Trump still has a has a, a chance. That is a, a, quite an important point because yeah. uh, the the liberal classes would love for us to dump all of this on Donald Trump. Yeah. So you demonstrate against Trump and maybe overthrow him and get that nice Hillary Clinton instead, or even a, a, a third term for that nice Barack Obama instead. Obama deported more illegal aliens. Mm -hmm. He, uh, Bill Clinton tripled the rate mm -hmm. of imprisonment of black people. There's a small nation, not so small, of black people in prison as a result of Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton, we came, we saw, he died, yeah. how she laughed at the sodomy and murder of Gaddafi, the former uh, leader of Libya and so on. The Democrats are as bad as the Republicans, the Clintons and the Obamas are as bad as Trump. And we've got to keep saying that, even if we're the only people doing so, don't you think? I agree, absolutely. And, and, and as we discussed last week, um, that while we can object to Trump, um, is he really the worst of the two evils when it comes to him or Hillary Clinton, who could have been in power? I still believe, Steve, that 
it's better that Trump got it than Hillary Clinton. Mm. It's the it's the the best uh, of two dreadful choices, yes. and this duopoly, two cheeks of the same arse yeah. uh, that the Republicans and the Democrats represent, is itself ghastly, of course. But I still believe that Hillary Clinton was the more dangerous of the two, if only for this reason. It's much easier for people like you and me to persuade people in the world of the moral bankruptcy of the United States when the fool who's leading them is so patently, obviously bonkers. Whereas if Clinton had got it, she would have fooled a lot more people, don't you think? I think it's an excellent point, actually. Yeah, that, that kind of that encapsulates my standpoint on it as well. Because if if Clinton had got in, then nothing would have changed at all, and 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 sort of business as usual, as it were. Not that there isn't business as usual under Trump, but as you say, yeah. we have more chance of but, convincing people of yeah. America's faults and and their regressive globalization and imperialism under Trump than we would have done under Clinton. I think so. Yeah. But hey, you know the. the the president would have been a woman, like the last president was black. But they're both soaked in blood. This is Topple Galloway. The World Cup in Russia is going splendidly well, and they tried so hard to spoil it. The dignitaries of Iceland have boycotted the World Cup in Russia even though their compatriots are there in significant numbers. 20% of all Icelandic people in the whole world are at the Russian World Cup and making quite a good fist of supporting quite a good team. And the British royal family aren't there either because Theresa May's government forbade them to go. But actually, the teams that we sanction are doing fantastically well. Iran are top of their group, even though Nike, because of sanctions, refuses to sell them the boots, balls, and sports equipment with which to play. Serbia are top of their group, even though we destroyed their country, dismembered it, and illegally invented the existence of a new state called Kosovo. Russia opened the World Cup with a 5 nothing victory. The best victory by any team in an opening game in the entire history of the World Cup. And everyone is talking about the warm welcome that everyone is receiving, including England fans, from the Russian people. The trains are running on time. The stadia are operating perfectly. But Steve Topol... Mm -hmm. The Russians should never have had the World Cup in the first place. After all, uh, Russia has occupied Crimea. Say the countries that have occupied almost all of the world. You couldn't make it up. Well, you couldn't make it up, really. It almost goes back to what we were talking about in the yeah. previous segment, this arrogance of the West that somehow their democracy is better than everyone yeah. else's yeah. Um, and, and, and Russia is the bogeyman and all this. Right. I have to admit, this is going to be a bit of an education for me, George. So I, I am your pupil. On, I'm not a football man, no, I'm afraid. But what you do know a lot about is the way in which power is distributed in the world. Let's just take one, mm. Britain. Yes. Britain illegally invaded and occupied Iraq in the last uh, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Britain illegally attacked and helped dismember Libya in the last 10 years. Britain is right now illegally attacking Syria and seeking its dismemberment, yet Britain is attacking Russia and opining that Russia should never have had the World Cup in the first place. 
Now that's capital H hypocrisy. That is capital H hypocrisy, and especially, as you say, the situation in Crimea. Um, I remember um, at the time in 2014 when Euro Maiden was happening, when the, the overthrow of the elected president in Ukraine was going on. Um, I remember tweeting at the time that this is a neo-Nazi fascist overthrow of a democrat democratically elected leader. I was called a conspiracy theorist for saying this, and, and suddenly, about a month ago, all the mainstream press are admitting there's now neo-Nazis yes, running Ukraine, really oddly enough. To the fact that there are Hitler lovers in the Ukrainian government. Indeed. And yet we're still sold um, that it was bad Russia invading Ukraine, even though I, I believe the Crimean president requested Russia's help at the time. Well, uh, Crimea was an autonomous republic. Mm -hmm. The word clue being in the word autonomous. Uh, there was a coup in Kiev. Uh, the Russian language was suddenly banned, mm -hmm. delegitimized, no longer an official uh, 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 language. 97% of the people of Crimea are Russian-speaking people. They held a plebiscite. Overwhelmingly, they decided to rejoin Russia. Of course, it had always been a part of exactly Russia, so. yes. uh, except in the very near historical past, and only then when Russia and Ukraine were both members of the same state, which was the uh, USSR. Uh, so the people of Crimea decided that uh, they wanted to rejoin Russia. And now there's a bridge uh, joining Russia and Crimea, a very fine bridge. And that page really has to be turned. Mm. But you know what? They have never forget. the British have never forgiven Russia for getting the World Cup because it should have been here. Well, now we're getting to the crux of the matter, aren't we? I think there's been such a concerted PR campaign against this. I mean, it, it would interest me, George, to find out who the Scripples are supporting, actually. Is it, would they be supporting England or Russia during this? Um, because the PR campaign against the Russian World Cup by the British and other Western countries has been phenomenal. What a very good point. I'd Me, to know. I'm with Egypt. So, this week, Theresa May has announced an extra £20 billion for the NHS over the next five-ish years. While it's been applauded by some in the political media, others have been slightly sceptical and Labour have come out and condemned it as not enough money. Um, George, Theresa May and the NHS, do we think that this money is going to make a difference or is it just going to be more of the same underfunding and sneakily privatising our health service? Well, any money coming into the NHS has got to be welcomed. Mm. Uh, the idea that this is the Brexit dividend is a bit rum, uh, not least because we haven't Brexited yet and it's not even entirely clear that we are uh, going to. But anybody that uh, trusts the Tories with the NHS in their hands probably needs to be in Ward 5 in Broadmoor themselves. You'd need to be crazy, actually, to believe that a party that hates the NHS with every fibre of its being can be trusted uh, with its uh, stewardship. Absolutely. I take real issue with this. Um, I always make the point and the, the caveat with my view of the NHS, <clears throat> excuse me, if you like this, I don't by any stretch of the imagination consider the NHS as perfect. No it, it, it has a lot of faults. Um, in my opinion, it's still a very creaking, outdated system. It's still got the same modus operandi in some respects as it had when it was first formed, where people go in one end and literally come out the other and that's the end of it. It needs, it still needs reform, it still needs improving. Not every single doctor and nurse is a saint. There are, there are quite a few some bad ones out there. However, I crunched some numbers this week um, on how much the average US family pays out in family health insurance every month. Um, and it's 650 quid. Every month. every month. Every month their family pays out in the US. Now the equivalent over here of national insurance contributions, we pay around £220 a month on average in national insurance contributions. So a third. A third of what America pays per family for their healthcare. So in terms of the principle of the NHS, that it should be free and it should be health not based around wealth, I, I fully support that. And 
you're correct in saying that we should not trust the Tories at all with the NHS. I mean, Oliver Letwin very famously wrote a paper back in the 1980s, then calling for the privatisation of the health service and a move to a US insurance-based style system. And this has continued over the course of the past few decades. Tony Blair's government um, playing into that scenario with private finance initiatives, those dodgy deals where they outsource the maintenance of buildings and the construction of hospitals to private companies at an extortionate amount of interest. And then since 2010, it's just continued. I mean, the, the figures speak for themselves. Since 2010 up to 2015, the amount paid out to private and independent companies by the NHS doubled from £4 billion a year to £8 billion a year. We've seen Richard Branson, the, the snake, the snake and shark of the corporate world, um, I like him really, um, that man gobbling up huge chunks of the NHS and then having the audacity to sue, sue, sue the public health service because they wouldn't give him a contract. Um, and by the way, he lives in a tax haven. He lives in a... He owns, actually. Yeah. He owns a yes. tax haven he, in the British Virgin yes. Islands. Where else? And yet he has the audacity to gobble up our public services and let's not get on to his train company either. However, um, I, th I think so, yes, we cannot believe Theresa May's pledge. And, and, and looking at the figures as well, it equates to a 3.4% increase every year um, in NHS spending. Now, those of us who are not politically engaged may go, ooh, that's a lot of money. But the average for the past few decades has been a 3.7% increase. So she's still not giving the NHS enough money. The Tories cannot be trusted with the National Health Service. And I think Labour are right to condemn this move. Um, however, it, there needs to be a broader on tackle, attack on what the Conservatives are doing. And we also need to highlight the stealth privatisation that is happening. Because let's face it, this is our NHS. And if we're not careful, we are going to lose it. Well, I agree with you in every respect there. Uh, but especially the note of caution that you introduced. Mm. It is never good enough merely to defend the status quo because the real lived experience of large numbers of people is that the status quo is not good enough. Yes. And it is true that not everything in the NHS garden is rosy. Mm -hmm. It is true that not every doctor, God forbid, not even every nurse, though most of them are saints, angels, not everyone is. Not every midwife is. Mm -hmm. I've got personal experience of that with the birth of the first of my own children. So it's not, it cannot be just the defense of what we have already. Yes. But Michael Moore's great film, Sickle, compared and contrasted the health system in the United States, the health system in Britain, the health system in France, and the health system in Cuba. And in descending order, mm -hmm. that was a proper league table for the health system with America at the bottom and Cuba, a third world country, was right at the topple. <laughs> Indeed. I, I think the NHS is best summed up, George, in the fact that it's not perfect. However, in the words of a very famous song about a taxi, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. So, George, we've recently had Father's Day, haven't we? Bliss, and... it was bliss. <laughs> Breakfast in bed. Oh, lovely. And I thought that as, as a sort of take on that, if you like, as both our fathers are no longer with us, uh, I thought it would be quite nice to talk about them today. Yeah, and, and what would our fathers make of the UK in 2018? So, so I know nothing about your dad. So. Well, my father was a remarkable man. Like yours, he was uh, very political, left wing in the labor movement, a trade union official, a labor party activist. Uh, and he died just weeks before Tony Blair became the Labour Prime Minister okay. in Britain. He was very much looking forward to this. Mm. He was more pragmatic than me, he took the view, well, let, let's get Labour in, mm. and then we can work on making the Labour government better. Ha! Uh, so, in a way, of course, I, I'm not happy that he died, but at least he never had to see mm. a Labour Prime Minister destroying the world. My father had a great capacity for believing in Britain. Mm. 
He believed that Britain was the best country in the world. Scotland was the best part of Britain. Dundee <laughs> was the independent supporters. Yeah, Dundee was the best part of uh, Scotland, mm -hmm. and our family were the best family <laughs> in uh, Dundee. He was very, in a way, patriotic, chauvinistic in a way that I I never uh, have been. Tell tell me about your father. Uh, my dad. Um, he, he, yeah, he's was quite a character in himself. He was an engineer in the um, Dan Buster's 617 Squadron, yeah? The only, mm. Yeah, the only reason he didn't fly um, was because his eyesight was so terrible, so otherwise he would have been a pilot. So, yeah. so he helped load the, the heroic and famous uh, yeah. Dan Buster crew. Yes, he was, he was on the ground um, with that squadron. Unbelievable. Doing engineering. So, he was a political man too. He was, yeah. He was, um, he, was, he was quite the thing, my father. He was a member of the Communist Party for many years, um, especially sort of in the 50s and 60s. He was quite prominent um, being a member in Ilford. The one lovely story he always used to tell me that always stands out was that whenever they had their Communist Party meetings, um, they always used to open them by saying, and a very special welcome to our friends at the back who were, of course, special branch. Um, yeah, I, 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 there must be a file uh, on you, or <laughs> at least on your family. I do wonder sometimes, the topple name. There must um, be because, oh, I mean, first of all, the, the name is a standout. Your father was very prominent. Uh, I, I know uh, of your father, though I never had the good fortune to meet him. Mm. But all communists would have been under surveillance to uh, some extent or another. Mm. But but a communist who was an engineer who knew how to load <laughs> the Dam <damn> Busters <laughs> bombers. I'd never thought of it like he that. He must have been Blimey. under uh, under special, I mean, it all came out when the papers began to get released and so on, that there was always at least one member of the leadership of the British Communist Party who was actually a policeman. Yeah. There was already uh, long ago we knew that the secretary to the General Secretary, who sat and took the notes at the party meetings, was an MI5 agent. They had bugs in the wall in King Street, mm -hmm. in Covent Garden, where the party headquarters was. My goodness, that'd be worth a few bob today. Yeah. Covent Garden, one of the most uh, bijou parts yeah. of London. That's where the communists were, in King Street. And uh, when they demolished it to redevelop it as I don't know, a, a, a ritzy restaurant or something, they found all kinds of bugs actually in the, in the walls. So all of the deliberations of the party were uh, under uh, observation. And your father, I'm pretty sure, uh, must uh, have been also, you can apply now mm. to the security services to see uh, the file of people uh, okay. now dead, if I you're, uh, I think that's not a bad idea. Let's go down together and <laughs> <laughs> see if we can see our own, our own uh, files. Hey, um, but I miss my father every day. Uh, I miss him more now than I paid attention to him when he was alive, which is a lesson to all of you. Uh, many weeks would go by without me thinking about my father when he was alive, but no day goes by now, especially as I look at my own sons. Mm. Uh, that I don't uh, remember and miss my father and all the grandchildren that he never uh, had the chance to see. And my four-year-old boy asked me last night if he will ever see uh, his grandfather. And I told him, if you live a good life, you may go to heaven where I'm sure he'll be. Indeed, yes. I think... Um yeah, I'm quite the same about my father. He was quite similar to yours, that he was pragmatic about the Labour Party, which he eventually ended up converting to um, in sort of Ben's era of the early 80s. Um, and uh, he, he, his position was the same, but he lived to see Tony Blair get in. My father died in 2007. And I remember him cursing and swearing towards towards the end of his life about Blair and his government. Um, my, my mornings when I was at home were consumed with the morning star being way furious furiously at me and then the evenings because my dad was a semi-professional jazz, jazz musician who played with a guy called Kenny Ball and his jazz men oh, they, um, were, they were top jazz they were yes and my dad played with them so would he play um, all sorts of instruments, saxophone, clarinet, trumpet. Um, I have a saxophone band. here. Have you inherited any of those skills? I was not a saxophonist, no. I'm a lot of fists but I was never a saxophonist. Uh, um, so Next week I promise you the sax will at least be in plain sight, even if you don't hear it. 
So, George, if our fathers were alive today, how would they sum up the UK in 2018 in three words? Go on. <laughs> ah, total shambles. Excellent. And I know what mine would say. He would say, bloody rotten Tories. Ah, we've been topple Galloway. We have, and we've been getting lots of requests and interactions online from you people watching at home. If you have any questions that you'd like us to raise in next week's show, please feel free to drop them on Twitter. It's either at Mr Topple or at George Galloway. And who knows, we might pick yours out of the proverbial hat next week. Just one more thing. I have applied through my agent directly to the production company that makes BBC Question Time. After 25 years, the chair of BBC QT has become vacant. And as someone who first appeared on the show under Sir Robin Day during the miners' strike of 1984-85, and who last appeared on it two years ago, I think it must have been something I said, I am applying for the job. I have presented thousands of television and radio shows over the last 12 years, most of them live. I am articulate, I'm knowledgeable, and I'm unafraid. That's why I'm sure BBC Question Time are going to give me the gig. Why not tell them you think it's a very good idea? Um, just one more thing, actually. Richard Bloody Branson. This is a man who started off with his own little record shop in the 70s, selling LPs, and he is now one of the most nefarious, corrupt, tax-avoiding men ever to grace the capitalist scene in this country. Not only is he running failing franchises on trains, he's suing the NHS for not letting him have services, and not only does he avoid tax, allegedly, he avoids it by owning a whole tax-evading island. This man is a menace to society. He should not be allowed anywhere near our public services, especially the NHS or trains, and yet the government still seems happy to keep giving him his, these contracts. But we need to do something about men like him, because without protest and without raising our own concerns, the likes of Richard Branson will continue to get their claws into our public services forever. <laughs>